So welcome everybody. We're here with Ralph Ellis today on the Megalithomania YouTube channel, our video podcast. Now, Ralph spoke at Megalithomania a couple of years ago, and he did a lecture about megaliths and ancient sites of the Bible lands, including Gebekli Tepe, Baalbek, and others. And today we've got him here because Ralph is going to be joining us as our special guest host in ancient Egypt from the 26th of October to the 7th of November 2022. And we are very excited about this. Obviously, we, we go every year as Megalithomania tours um, to Egypt, but it's the first time Ralph's going to be coming with us. So we're going to get into some things regarding Egypt today specifically, but also we're going to be looking at metrology, the links with sites such as Avebury and Stonehenge and and other things like this, and also some of the secrets in ancient Egypt you may not have heard about. Now, Ralph's been studying biblical chronology and ancient Egypt for 30 years. He's released a number of books. His latest is called Shards of Illumination. And one of his classics is Thoth, Architect of the Universe. I actually have the old version here oh, and yes. the new version. And so we've got, it's a, it's a great book. I read it many years ago, you know, almost soon after it came out, actually. And it really gets into this idea of this ancient, global system like these sites almost like represent maps and they encode all this metrology and these other elements which absolutely fascinate me and should fascinate any megalithomaniacs so we're going to start talking about that today before we get into the whole egyptian story so how are you doing ralph great to have you here yeah great to be with you Hugh. and uh, yeah looking forward to the trip sounds sounds great yeah, I mean, one of the other things about the trip, I think, which is um, uh, is that we've got the private access to the Assyrian and yeah. the Serapium is now open as well. And I understand that they may have been closed last time you were there. So, so what, you know, what, yes. so, I mean, these, these are two things, two of the highlights of the trip really, but what, what you know, before we get into you know, the official kind of questions we've got, we've got lined up, what, what got you fascinated by ancient Egypt in the first place? Yeah, I, I actually started on the um, biblical research first. So I've been doing the biblical research ever since I was a kid. So uh, ever since age 14, um, I didn't really get into the Egyptian side of it until uh, sort of in the early 90s, when some of these uh, more esoteric books were coming out about uh, Egypt. And so I decided to start looking at um sites in Britain, megaliths in Britain, simply because I, it was difficult for me to get to Egypt at that time. And I did uh, quite a lot of research into the British megaliths. And then, of course, once you've done that, you've got to go to Egypt, you know, to have a look at uh, what is over there. So I did several trips. I think I've been there four or five times now to Egypt. And the more I started researching and writing, the more I needed to go back to Egypt to investigate um, all the various sites that I needed to look at, both for the megaliths and also for the uh, religious work that I've been doing. Because, of course, you know, people like Akhenaten, uh, central to my story on the religious side of it, uh, well, you've got to go and see where Akhenaten was. So I did um, central Egypt, where he was down at Damana which not many people do because it's very difficult to get to down there at Elmina. Um, and I had to have an army personnel carrier to take me down there because you've got to be protected at that time as well. So that was all fun. Uh, and then doing the trip up to Tanis, which I understand you've done a lot at Tanis as well. Not many people get to Tanis, so that was very interesting, a very um, enigmatic site there up at uh, Tanis. So, yeah, uh, Egypt was central to my first book actually because that that thoth book was the first book i ever released actually that was back in 97 i think it was so 25 years ago now it's getting on um looking at the megaliths of egypt but of course starting with the uh, british megaliths so start at avebury and stonehenge because i i got the impression and i still have the impression that they're all linked together so with this megalithic era uh that we see all across the world although i haven't done so much in the uh, central and south american megaliths 
but they're all linked in some fashion. And one imagines that that megalithic, megalithic era was a specific era at some point in the past. And all of these megaliths were created at that particular time. Um, and that's what I was writing about in Thoth because I found elements of the, well, let's start with the British megaliths that indicated there was a bit of a sort of worldwide plan about this, that they were trying to encode, uh, you might say secrets, but basically knowledge, the knowledge they had of the world and the cosmos at that particular time, um, which is far above what they're given credit for now within modern academia. And um, I don't know if you want to carry on now straight into uh, Avebury, perhaps? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Let's start yeah. talking about Avebury, because that's one of the things I, I actually really noticed about uh, when, I, when I read Thoth, Architect of the Universe. So we're going to bring up a couple of slides now. So, uh, so Ralph. Can, yeah, so if uh, we have a look at the uh, Avebury image that has the Earth attached to it, and we can have a look at a comparison between the two, because you have this great henge, which is half a kilometre across, so it's quite large. Um, with a number of megaliths around in a big circle. And you've got to sort of ask yourself, what, what is this representing? You know, people glibly say it's a temple or whatever. Um, but what's it representing? There we are. It's now nicely in focus. Um, well, let's look at it in plan view as it is here. And uh, what we have is a large circle with uh, a definite sort of equator across the middle and sort of um, a sort of North Pole and a sort of South Pole to it. And it's leaning at 22 and a half degrees from due north. So it's sort of skewed to the left a little bit. And I was sitting there pondering this particular image and thinking, what were they trying to do? You know, if they were sending any messages to the future, um, via their great megaliths, then what were they encoding? What is this picture? And then it struck me that this is planet Earth floating in space. And so we have the um, equator going across the center. We have the uh, axis of the Earth, and it's inclined, of course, with obliquity. It's, it's inclined at, well, now it's 23 and a half degrees from uh from the vertical uh from the plane of the ecliptic and avebury does exactly the same and is this what they were encoding that they knew the form and shape of the earth uh they knew the heliocentric model of the solar system etc cetera, etc cetera. um information knowledge that's well in advance of what we would give them credit for nowadays and the proof of this was the other aspects on this map. So I haven't drawn it all here because I'm keeping some of that uh, back for anyone who wants to read the book or for when we go on the uh, trip, of course, and we can talk about this in more detail. But uh, in the northern hemisphere of the Avebury Earth, you can see this little cove shape uh, within a circle. So there's a circle of megaliths and then this uh, cove, this trilithon, I suppose, um, of large stones forming this sort of C shape pointing out towards the uh, northeast. And it just struck me that that sort of shape was very, very similar to the, um, uh, to the main sarsen stones we see at Stonehenge. So that forms a C shape as well at Stonehenge, pointing out towards the northeast exactly the same as this does. Um, yeah, here we are. We can see the um, uh, image of Stonehenge from above, and and not looking at the 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 Sarsen Circle which you see there, but it's more difficult to see. But inside the Sarsen Circle, you'll see a sort of C shape, um, a sort of half an ellipse, and that's the the element that I was thinking is encoded into the Avebury circle. And so it's sort of marking Stonehenge on the Avebury Earth. 
And if you count up the number of stones that go around that particular um, C shape at Avebury, uh, you end up with 26 stones. And if you double that, you get 252, uh, which is the latitude of uh, Stonehenge uh, in, in uh, Wiltshire. So it's like it's encoding the actual latitude of Stonehenge within the Avebury Circle, as if they knew how to divide up the Earth into latitude and longitude. And that was proven, I've not shown it on the diagram, but there's another circle uh, inside the, uh, the Avebury Henge uh, in the Southern Hemisphere, as it were. And that equates to another artifact on the face of the earth down in the southern hemisphere and that's very interesting because of course that's indicating that whoever designed Avebury not only knew the form and shape of the earth and knew where Stonehenge was in the northern hemisphere but they also knew of a specific artifact uh, down in the southern hemisphere as well and marked it with the correct um, line of latitude as well. That is, that is very, very interesting. It's, it's good to get this up there. I mean, one, one of the things that, um, you know, one of our inspirations for megalithomania is obviously the work of John Michel. And as you, oh, yes. as you mentioned, you mentioned this idea that uh, it's like marking its own latitude. And I think, it was yes. John, I think it was John that actually found that the exact latitude of Avebury is 360 divided by seven and then the yes, latitude it jumps out so and also so clearly Avebury is what you know one seventh of the way around the planet you know yes if you equator. look on that diagram that you've got up there you'll see next to the uh, red marker it gives the latitude north and it says 52 25 uh 45 i think it is or 40 48 so 50 50 51 degrees 20 uh 25 minutes and 45 seconds it is and if you do 360 divided by seven that is exactly the latitude of Avebury and it puts it in the pub car park and I don't know if you've been to Avebury people listening um, but uh, in the center of the Henge there is a pub there and that latitude puts you in in the pub car park in the center of um, in the center of Avebury so it's pretty accurate <laughs> So, that, so that, that is fascinating. So basically, you know, just to make point out the most important part of Avebury is the pub. You know, I think yeah, it, it, yeah, even the course. ancients, the ancients <laughs> saw that coming. That that is very impressive. It's probably been there for five thousand years. <laughs> so yeah, so this this geodesy, this kind of layout of um, uh, the way these sites. Uh, on the planet is is unbelievable really i mean you've done work uh, obviously relating to the Giza plateau as well um and how that fits in with the kind of systems that you yeah were just covering. just before we zoom over there if we just have a look at that stonehenge image again as well the stonehenge okay. sorry yes the stonehenge image with uh yeah that one and you'll see there's a henge around Stonehenge as well. So we have the Stonehenge in the middle, but then we have an earthwork henge around the um, perimeter. And inside that um, earthen henge, you'll see two round, smaller ditch ring systems. Uh, and they are interesting as well because they equate exactly with the uh, precession of the equinox of the earth. And so if we go on to the image of uh, Stonehenge and the Earth together, um, that one, you will see that on the right-hand side, we have the real Earth and the Earth processes like a gyroscope. And it forms a circle to the north and to the south of the axis of the Earth. And you can see the circles. I've drawn them in there. Um, on the right hand side. But if you look on the left hand side and we look at Stonehenge, you see that Stonehenge has exactly the same two little circles, the two little circles we saw on the plan view of Stonehenge. And they appear to be marking the procession of the equinox of the earth. Um, and they're pretty much in exactly the same sort of angle as the angle of the earth. So the angle of the earth at present is 23 and a half degrees. 
Now, this procession, if that's what this is, if this is a processional diagram drawn uh, in this, you know, megalithic earthwork at Stonehenge, they give the angle of obliquity at 22 and a half degrees. Not quite the same, one degree dif difference. Now, that's interesting because that might be able to date uh, Stonehenge for us because, of course, the angle of obliquity changes over a 40,000-year cycle. And we have measured that cycle, and we know exactly what that cycle is. And so th the Earth had an angle of obliquity of 22 and a half degrees, as in the Stonehenge diagram, 30,000 years ago. That is so ancient. That is, I mean, we, yeah. know the, we know the wooden post holes, the pine post holes are definitely around 10,000 years old. Yes. So are you suggesting that this is kind of <laughs> inkling it could be three times as old as that? Yes. Well, I was expecting when I measured this, I was expecting 10,500 BC, of course, like most people would. And of course, I looked it up on it. The, all this has been plotted by... Oh, I forget the name of the professor now. Anyway, you can you can find it all online and it's all been plotted out for the previous. He's done 20 million years anyway <laughs> of uh, obliquity. He's gone back 20 million years and uh, given the precise cycle of it. Uh, and of course, it wasn't 10,000 years ago. It's the other way. So um, 10,000 years in the future, it will be 22 and a half degrees. But going back into the past, the closest we have is 30,000 years ago. And that sort of surprised me. So if, if that is what Stonehenge is trying to tell us, then it's indicating that Stonehenge is 30,000 years old. Um, that was a bit of a shocker to me, but there we go. <laughs> That's going to be a shock to everybody listening to this. I think <laughs> that that is that is quite epic. So, um, but for now, just wanted to um, get into ancient Egypt. I also want to mention the fact that um, we have Ralph is going to be joining us at the uh, Megalithomania conference on the seventh and eighth of May, and hopefully, we're going to get into this kind of stuff in a, into more depth because. This is just what megalithomania is all about, trying to understand this very sophisticated nature of the ancients. So, so let's let's start chatting about Egypt. I mean, this is a this is. I mean, we've got the we found this fascinating introduction with Avebury and Stonehenge, but in Thoth book, Thoth the Architect of the Universe, you discuss the idea that these sites you know including the ones we've just looked at but also the pyramids uh, and others um they actually encode measurements um linking these cultures up you know like the, you, you talk about the imperial measurements of britain are based on the Giza pyramids but now you you've just pushed the date back potentially of stonehenge <laughs> so which way round is it and what kind of you know is there a, a handful of these measurements you could like mention which are just mind-blowing and and kind of you know sort of prove this theory well we didn't rediscover these measurements until the elizabethan era so we're talking you know 500 years ago um that's when the imperial measurement system was made uh and so that i think it was a rediscovery and if people don't know what I'm talking about, it's because there's a bit of an unmentionable about the Great Pyramid. And I don't know why this has not been highlighted by anyone else. Um, the Great Pyramid has a very specific measurement system. Uh, it's using the uh, royal cubit, which I call the Thoth cubit. And the measurement around the base is 1,760 cubits. And that's a very specific number because it's a pi number. It's based on uh, the pi uh, fractional uh, equivalent of pi, which is 22 over 7. And if you multiply that by 40, this wonderful number 40 that is all over the Old Testament, uh, then you get um, 280 and 880. So 280 high and 880 around the base. But of course, with the Great Pyramid, you have to multiply by two because it's not just pi. It's the formula for a circle. 
So it's two pi r. So you've got to multiply by two. And therefore, you get 1760 as being the perimeter length around the base of the Great Pyramid. Uh, might sound like an unusual number to have, but Americans, you should know this if you're over in America, because you're still on the imperial system. And of course, the imperial mile is 1,760 yards. And so I think there's been a, a direct copy here. Someone, because this imperial system was only invented in the Elizabethan era, and that was just about the time when Egypt was being opened up again to the West. Um, and, you know, only 100 years later, uh, Britain had gone over there in force. Well, France went over there in force first. And then, of course, the British followed and, and it became definitely a part of sort of Western culture. And I think that some point in the 15, mid to late 1500s, uh, someone had been to Giza and they had found this measurement system because we appear to be using it in the um, imperial system. So the imperial system is, and you have to ask yourself why we have such a crazy system. So we have a, uh, a chain is 22 yards. That's the length of a cricket pitch. You don't play cricket in America, but there we go, um, is 22 yards. A rod is 5.5 yards. Now, why would you have such an odd system as 5.5 for a measurement length? It's because it's a quarter of pi. So pi is 22 over 7. A quarter of 22 is 5.5. That's where it all came from. So the imperial system is based on pi exactly the same as the Great Pyramid is based on pi. They follow one another. Um, but as I say, I think we inherited that. So the, the Great Pyramid was based upon pi, and that could have been built at any time in the distant past. So that could have been built 10,000 years ago. It could have been 30,000 years ago and just sitting there on the Giza Plateau and encoding that information for later mathematicians, astronomers to have a look at and actually measure and discover. And I think that's what happened. So it's rather like Josephus Flavius says, this is where my megalithic material and my religious material all starts to dovetail because Josephus Flavius said that there were two pillars made in the distant past. One was made of brick and the other was made of stone and they encoded the knowledge uh, of mankind. And that's sort of what we're seeing with, with the pyramids and maybe the um, ziggurats in Babylon or whatever as well, one made of brick, one made of stone, and they're encoding information because the Great Pyramid is a Pi Pyramid. The second pyramid is a Pythagorean Pyramid. It's three, four, five. And if you go down to Dashur and have a look at the Red Pyramid, that's a um, 2021, 20, 29 uh, Pythagorean py Pyramid again. So all of these pyramids are encoding definite aspects of mathematics and astronomy and various other things as well. And do you think these the, the the pyramids then were like partly part of their purpose was to actually be like a library of information in stone? Yes. Yes, it's it's like the idea of of a hall of records, but this is only part of the hall of records. I think there is another hall of records elsewhere, uh, but it's encoding information, it's encoding knowledge to tell you how much they understood, how much the architects, the designers of these um, megalithic monuments understood. You know, like Stonehenge and Avebury, it's saying to anyone who looks at these monuments, hey. I knew the form and shape of the earth, you know, that's how much knowledge I used to know 10,000 years ago, 30,000, whenever these megaliths were built. It's, it's, it's more than just signing your name on a piece of stone. It's saying, this is what I knew in this era. And it's an awful lot more than you give us credit for, basically. Well, it was quite convenient. They did it in huge lumps of stone, which are impossible. That's why they did it, yes. Yeah. That's why the megaliths are megaliths. It was designed. And that's how we know that these 
these monuments were designed to last, you know, for a hundred thousand years minimum, if if we hadn't have start started playing around with them and digging them up. Um, so this message was designed to last for millennia, fifty thousand years, hundred thousand years. That was the intent of the designer, and so. This wasn't just any old monument just built as a tomb. This was a message for the future, for the distant future. It's almost like these, you know, the, the, this, this, this placing this tomb theory on sites such as the Great Pyramid and, and many other sites. It just, it just takes away this kind of what we're talking about. It takes away yeah. this people, this yearning and this, this intention to study what's actually right in front of us. Because a lot of people nowadays they're not into maths they're not into geometry they're not into pi and understanding geodesy or astronomy these are really things we're not taught anymore but i think obviously in ancient times <clears throat> excuse me that was a different matter and so <clears throat> i think people need to look again at like numbers and like <clears throat> how important this is within these sites and actually that is you know the language of the ancients the way they conveyed messages through time which 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 can't you know you can't mistranslate numbers very easily whereas you can mistranslate hieroglyphs and lost languages um so i find that you know it's like it's like the universal constant um it, we find it is maths yeah. maths is the universal language uh it's it's visible in for any culture in any era it won't change it'll be exactly the same so this one looks very, very complicated. What can you tell <laughs> us about this? Uh, yes, and the, the the partner of this is even more complicated because it has the Queen's Chamber underneath it. But anyway, this was just uh, re-measuring the pyramids um, in not just Thoth cubits, the royal cubit, but in the um, what I called the Thoth rod, which is five and a half cubits. So I think that these pyramids were all designed in Thoth rods, basically, uh, measuring five and a half um, uh, cubits each. And yes, most of the items within the pyramids all agree uh, with this being a pi pyramid, that it was based on 22 over seven, the uh, pi fractional. And so this is just demonstrating that most of the internal components, you can see here the king's chamber uh, and the shafts that come out of the king's chamber, um, are all definite designed artifacts. They're not just sort of random um, shafts and, and uh, uh, chambers that are just put in any particular position um, within the pyramid. They were actually designed to be at specific locations. And there was a good reason for that. So that was interesting that they all sort of married up to this idea that this was a pie pyramid. You have this, you, you sent over this as well. You, you talk about like specific locations of the design of the pyramid, but you talk about locations on the planet are encoded into this design. You sent us this graphic <laughs> here, which is absolutely fascinating, um, which we've got two, we've got two of these actually, but this just shows you the kind of the area above the King's chamber turned upside down. We've also got this one as well, which kind of um, is another map, but if, if maybe if we start with this one, you could like describe what's going on here. Yes. Well, the, the question then becomes, why do we have all of these chambers in these pyramids? Because these pyramids were not tombs, as, as you said. Um, no pharaoh in his right mind would be buried in a, a tomb that didn't glorify his name and didn't have you know, the Book of the Dead inscribed all over it. Um, so we know that these tombs were not, sorry, these chambers were not tombs. Um, so what are they? Uh, they were definitely very important. I mean, they were made in, in huge, great slabs of granite, which is very, very difficult to get up such a huge mass of, of the Great Pyramid. Um, so they were hugely important. But why were they there in specific locations? And then why above the um, King's Chamber, we have all of these smaller chambers? Obviously, on this diagram, they're upside down, but these are known as the relieving chambers. And they serve absolutely no purpose. Um, they called them relieving chambers because they thought they were leaving, relieving stresses on the top of the king's chamber. But of course, 
um, they're doing no such thing. All of the all they're doing is holding up the mass of air that's above them, which is you know probably about um, one kilo maybe. Um, you might as well have put the roof, the um, angled roof of the chamber above the first uh, ceiling. But they didn't. They added one, two, three, four, five of these ceilings above the king's chamber for no good reason. And so that took a long time to discover what it was. And I, I actually discovered it because I had the diagram sitting upside down on my wall because it turned itself upside down. And I was sitting there looking at this thinking, hold on a minute. If Avery can be uh, giving us an image of the earth floating in space, then surely the Great Pyramid might be giving us something that's more complex. And it just struck me that these chambers were looking very, very similar to the continents of the earth. And this is one of those continents. And it gives you the sort of shape of Africa. But more than that, it gives you the lines of latitude that are associated with Africa as well. So now we have a rationale for why we have these relieving chambers. They're not just ridiculous items attached to the top of the king's chamber. Each one of them gives a line of latitude, well, a line of 10 degrees of latitude. And so we go all the way from 30 north to 30 south on Africa, and then capped at the base there, uh, obviously up the other way, it would be on top, um, with, the, uh, with the angled roof beams of the chamber. And so we have a complete image, as it were, of Africa being drawn in megalithic stone. And if we go back to the full image of all of the chambers in the um, King's Chamber, sorry, in the Great Pyramid, uh, the, the other one going the other way, that one, we see that the other chambers in the Great Pyramid might be indicating parts, um, continents of the earth as well. So we have this massive great uh, chamber um, that leads up to the king's chamber. It's, it's the grand gallery and it's, it's, it's a pathway that runs up towards the king's chamber, but it's got this roof that is, I, I don't know what it is actually, it's probably about 30 um, 30 cubits, 15 meters high. Anyway, it's an enormous great gallery that runs up towards the king's chamber and it has absolutely no rational reason for it being there. Lots of people have speculated why it's there. I mean, it's a very difficult thing to actually design and build into your um, pyramid. And yet it seems to have no reason for it being there. But of course, if it's taken in profile like this and you look at it as being the continents of the earth, well, it's, it's indicating that it's the whole of Asia. And then the little antechamber, which is just there before you get to the king's chamber, is the, um, uh, the Arabias before you get to the uh, continent of Africa. And so like Avebury, which is giving you an image of the earth, here in the Great Pyramid, we're getting uh, an image of the continents of the Earth, a very detailed image of the continents of the Earth. And again, there's, there's only one reason for doing that. It's, it's the designer is showing off the amount of knowledge and information they had in this era. It's, um, it's saying, look, we knew the form and shape of the Earth. And the other reason why you might want to do that is because, well, you have a map here. And what do you do with maps? You mark something on it. And so what we could have here is a sort of X marks the spot. Um, if you have a map, then maybe we're marking something upon that map. And uh, that was something I went looking for in the next book, which was called... Um, K2 Quest of the Gods. So yeah, I would think they were actually marking something on this map. So we have a map 
put an X on it and you can go and have a look there and see what you find. So this is this K2 book. This is the, the theory that based upon the work you were doing here, then you believe you found maybe the hall of records isn't in egypt is somewhere completely different i mean yes. um, i mean because and and did because you went out there as well didn't you you went out i to... I, I did because the rationale was because everyone was looking for a hall of records i'm not entirely sure uh how old this idea is for a hall of records um but there was always some idea that there was some uh knowledge that had been stored from the ancient times sort of like a library of alexandria that had been buried somewhere you know and you could go and discover it um but it always struck me that you would never if there was such a place you would never uh place it on the giza plateau or, or someone you know in the nile delta where someone digging a well would go and find it just digging a well you would want it to be in a more sort of secure location than that and of course, if you have an image of all of the continents of the earth, then you can put it somewhere uh, much more remote and much more secure. And that brings us on. I don't know if I put it on there, the um, star shaft pointing uh, diagram. I think it was the last diagram in the list. Because oh, that's the door. We could talk about that before we go on to. Um, so th the door of the Great Pyramid is interesting because um it was always known that there was a door strabo tells us about it uh you know second century bc he describes the door and this is my diagram based on what strabo said so the entrance to the great pyramid was always known about so in which case why do we have that tunnel that was dug they call it the al mamun tunnel that is dug into the side of the pyramid why do we have that tunnel going bodily into the side of the pyramid when the entrance was already known? The reason, I think, is because uh, that Al Mamun tunnel was not dug into the pyramid to go and find the chambers. It was dug out of the pyramid in order to get something out. Because there's a problem if, if you have something. Um, that you found in one of the uh, chambers, the queen's chamber or the king's chamber. There is no way you could get it out because it has to go round the join between the ascending and descending passages. And it's not possible to do that. And anything of length, like a sarcophagus or whatever, you know, will happen to be there. You cannot get it out of the pyramid. The only way you can do that is to dig another tunnel out of the pyramid yourself. And that's exactly what Al Mamun did. And so the Al Mamun tunnel was to get something out of the pyramid that they had found in one of the chambers. Uh, but of course, we don't know what they found. There is no record of that. But um, there would no, be no point in digging that tunnel for any other reason, because everybody knew where the entrance to the Great Pyramid was. It was just above the Al Mamun tunnel. And so this was kind of like this was like a hidden entrance. So you got you got this image here. You got this stone on the front. Yep. So that so that would hide it pretty much. So you wouldn't be able uh, to see it. It could do, but of course, um, from history, Strabo knew about it. Moses knew about it because. Um, should we go into one of the secrets of the Old Testament? Should, yeah. Why not? Why not? Why not? Um, the, the, the secret of the Old Testament is how on earth did the, the Israelites lose their sacred mountain? So the Israelites were consummate um, chroniclers. They chronicled everything. And yet somehow they lost the position of Mount Sinai. How on earth did they manage to do that? Well, they didn't. They never did lose it. Um, and, and so to refine Mount Sinai, what you have to do is look at the attributes of it. And so Mount Sinai is, uh, is the largest uh, mountain in the area. It's sharp and difficult to climb. Uh, it's on the edge of a desert. It has a cave inside it where God lived, uh, where Moses went up to go and see God. 
uh, and it's small. It might be a large mountain, but it's small enough that you can cordon it off at the bottom because you weren't allowed to touch it. So you could have put a fence around the bottom of it. And the other thing was at the bottom of it, there was a, a, a black smooth pavement that looked like the night sky. Now, where do we find such a mountain? Well, we're looking at it here. Mount Sinai is the Great Pyramid of Giza. Uh, it is the tallest pyramid in, in the whole of Egypt. It's sharp and difficult to climb. Uh, it's on the edge of a desert. It does have a cave inside it. That cave was always open, so the entrance to the pyramid was always open. You could go down to the bottom of the pyramid. It's not shown on this diagram, but anyway, there's a, there's a rough cave at the bottom of the uh, Great Pyramid. And of course, if you go on the eastern side of the Great Pyramid, you will find the black basalt pavement that was smooth and looked like the night sky. So I don't have a picture of it here. I have another one actually, so I could attach uh, another picture at another time. What, what, um, are these, what are these then we're also looking at? This, 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 this is the erosion. Um, this is another way we can date the pyramids. So we had this big discussion, of course, in the 90s and beyond with uh, Robert Schock and uh, John Anthony West and various other people uh, about the erosion patterns on the, um, uh, on the Sphinx enclosure. And indeed, they are right. There's quite a lot of uh, erosion, water erosion on the Sphinx enclosure. The trouble is with the Sphinx enclosure is you've got nothing really to compare it with. And so it's very difficult to give yourself a definite date. Um, but I thought, well, why not look at a definite erosion pattern, a differential erosion pattern? So what we have here is the original base of the Great Pyramid um, before they stripped off the um, casing stones. And as it happens, they put the casing stones on top of a pavement. And this is the pavement they put the casing stones on. And the line you see running down here is where the casing stones used to be. So on the right, there were casing stones. On the left, it was always open uh, you know, to the weather, to the rain, to the feet of pilgrims, whoever was walking there. And it was eroding away. And the right was always covered up. And then someone came along about a thousand years ago and stole the um, casing blocks, which were made of nice, pure white Tura limestone. And so what we have is a differential. So on the right-hand side, the erosion is 1,000 years. And on the left-hand side, the erosion is at least 10 times more. And so if the right side is 1,000 years, then the left side must be at least 10,000 years. And so we can get a sort of rough estimate of the age of the pyramid from this dual erosion. And that the next image probably gives another um, image of this dual erosion. And here we go again. So the right side was covered by the casing blocks. The left side was always open uh, to the atmosphere and to the feet of pilgrims. And you see there's a definite line again. And if you measure the difference in erosion, again, we get at least 10 times more erosion on the left than the right. And again, that's indicating that the Great Pyramid is at least 10,000 years old. And you can do the same down at Dashur as well. We get the same. Oh, there we go. And here's got a, a little image of um, how we do this. So left side, we have the pyramid with its cladding stones uh, on and the base is eroding. And note, of course, that that pavement stone at the bottom is one block. It's not a difference between two blocks. It's one piece of stone that's been eroding in, in a, uh, over a different amount of time. So on the left, we have erosion always happening on that little ledge coming out from the bottom of the pyramid. And then someone steals on the right side, someone steals the cladding stones. And now we get erosion on both sides of that uh, pavement uh, stone at the bottom. And as I say, the erosion differential is at least 10 times between the two.
And since we know when the casing blocks were stolen, roughly, uh, during the Muslim era, about 10,000 years ago, then we can estimate that the pyramid was at least uh, 10,000 years old, maybe much older, because some of the erosion is much, much greater uh, where the um, pavement block was always exposed. And on the next picture, I think is, is the side of the pyramid as well. We can get the same idea. We get some, yeah, here's the side of a pyramid. This is the um, uh, bent pyramid down at Dashur. And it still has its casing blocks on. And they are, well, they don't look like it here, but uh, if they were cleaned up, they are bright white Tura limestone, really high quality limestone. However, if you have a look at all of the little um, ovals I've put all over this, you will see that someone has repaired it. So all over this pyramid, from bottom to top on all four sides, someone has been around this pyramid and uh, chiseled out any little bits of um, casing stone that were decaying, being eroded, and they've put a new piece of stone in there. So someone has put scaffolding over the whole of this pyramid and repaired it. When was that done? Ah, and here's an, another piece. Again, you can see all of these repair blocks that have been put into the side of the pyramid. Um, and the question is, when was this done? Um, because it's not being done in recorded history. We have no information on someone repairing this pyramid. And how soon after a pyramid is built, would you need to repair it? I mean, surely it would be thousands of years before it would need repairing. This is fine Tura limestone. This is really durable stuff. You can see from the blocks here that have not been repaired, that many of these blocks are in almost sort of perfect condition since the time the um, pyramid was built. And of course, stone is not uniform. You know, some blocks will be stronger than others. Some will have inclusions or uh, fractures in them, and, and so they need repairing. But it would be thousands of years after the pyramid was constructed uh, that it would need repairing. So when was this done? Well, this pyramid is only really associated with one particular pharaoh, and that was Snorfru or Snefru, old, old uh, dynasty. Uh, so we're talking... Uh, I don't know when he was around. It's about 2,400 years ago. Anyway, uh, sorry, 2,400 BC, 4,400 years ago. And he's the pharaoh that's associated with this particular pyramid. But I'm pretty sure that these pyramids can last 4,000 years without needing repairing. So perhaps Snorfru didn't build this pyramid. Perhaps he repaired it. And if he did, then we could estimate that this pyramid was built at least twice, uh, at least twice as much time passed before it needed repairing by Snorfru. <clears throat> so if he's 4,500 years ago, then this pyramid must be at least 9,000 years old before it needed repairing by Snorfru. Uh, after 4,000 years of existence, and he repaired it 4,000 odd years ago. And now we see it in this condition now mm. with the repair blocks being put in 4,000 years ago and the rest of the pyramid being some 9,000 at least years old, depending on how much, <clears throat> how quickly you think these um, blocks eroded themselves. Isn't this the same as like um, on the Giza Plateau, where there's a theory that um, Khafre, like the second pyramid, was did a repair job? I mean, because and like you know, because we find a lot yes. of granite, we find a lot of granite on the middle pyramid and the small pyramid, and they appear to be kind of later. It's almost like and that's very similar in style to the Valley Temple as well where the statues of this particular pharaoh were found, which is, you know, but it seems there was a much older limestone construction, you know, that was the Valley Temple and the Sphinx Temple, obviously, and also around the pyramids as well. And so one of the theories that I've, I've read a lot about is that the same thing you're talking about with, with this one was 
applied on the Giza plateau. Do you think that? Do you think that's the case? And these are actually all much older. <clears throat> oh, I'm sure because we have the same on the Sphinx. Uh, we have this wonderful Sphinx, which was supposed to be built in the Old Kingdom era, but we have Old Kingdom repairs on the Sphinx body. Now, why would they having to be repairing the Sphinx when they'd only just made it? It rather, again, suggests that um, repairs were done during the Old Kingdom because the Sphinx was much, much older than that. Uh, and of course, if the Sphinx was looking at um, the processional uh, rise of Leo, as many people have suggested, then that would have been 10,500 BC. And that would equate with uh, old kingdom pharaohs having to repair it um, uh, in 2500 BC. Uh, so again, yes, that would uh, point in the same direction and end any repairs that were done to the Carfaror Great okay. Pyramids. Okay. That's, that's fantastic. So yeah, so this, this is, we're talking about some of the themes from um, Thoth, Architect of the Universe and other, other parts of um, um ralph's books here but i wanted to sort of change direction a little bit ralph and um maybe we could have a little look at something that fascinates me and this is the story of uh scota you know or ah, yes. and uh, because you know not only are we finding you know this fascinating story within egypt itself but there's an expanded story connecting with Britain again. So not only do you have the measurements and the connections possibly with Stonehenge and Avebury and things like this, but also I'm fascinated by this story from, what was it from the Scotty Chronicle? And I actually wrote, we actually wrote about this in one of Jim's recent book because there's all these, there's basically, there's a story that was recorded in this ancient Scottish document that says that the Queen Scota from uh, Egypt made a way via other places and, and settled and even founded Scotland and uh, ended up mm. in Ireland being buried there. So can you give us a little update on that about, you know, a, a rough outline of that, that story? Yes. Yeah, so I read about this um, many years ago and I thought the book I read didn't really do the uh, information justice. And so I took a deeper dive into this and had a, a, a and I actually followed the information around. I, I toured around all of the locations where I think they went to. Uh, and the interesting aspect is that, yes, this is recorded in Scotty Chronicon, which is from the 14th century. So it's quite old in Scotland. It's the ancient history of Scotland. But it's also taken from the Labor Gabala, which is 6th century in Ireland. Uh, and so we're going back a long way into the you know, dark, deep recesses of history here that someone recorded that was a, an exile from Egypt that ended up in Ireland and Scotland. And that's interesting on its own. And of course, it's always taken as mythology. But if you read Scotty Chronicon, it's quite apparent that, that there's a lot of information there. And so the first thing that sticks out is that uh, it was Walter Boer, I think, um, wrote it. He had a copy of Manetho. Manetho is the third century BC um, historian from Egypt who wrote and he virtually made the chronology that we have today for all of the pharaohs. That all of that chronology comes from Manetho with various additions and, and modifications. Well, whoever wrote uh, Scotty Chronicon had the works of Manetho because they follow his chronology. And the other interesting thing that I saw was it gives information about pharaohs um, who had been deleted from history. So it gives, um, it records the, the life of, of Akhenaten, who had been deleted from e Egyptian history. And it, it appears that the people who were exiled, and they're given as Queen Scota and, and King Gaethalos, uh, were actually uh, Pharaoh I and Queen Ankesenamun of the Amarna dynasty. And that makes sense because we don't have many occasions within Egyptian history when a pharaoh would have been kicked out. Doesn't happen very often. And somehow these, uh, you know, Irish and Scottish chroniclers knew that there was a possible exile out of Egypt during the Amarna era. And that's exactly what happened because, of course, Akhenaten and Nefertiti go missing. 
people say they died at Amarna, but there's no evidence whatsoever that they died at Amarna. And then later on, I and Enkesanamun also go missing. So I was, uh, we have Pharaoh Akhenaten, and then a couple of minor pharaohs, which might have been Nefertiti. Um, and then we go to King or Pharaoh uh, Tutankhamun, who everybody knows about. And then we jump to Pharaoh I, and he was the next pharaoh after Tutankhamun. And I say they're related. I say that uh, Tutankhamun might have been the son of Pharaoh I, because I don't think he was the son of Akhenaten. Uh, and so I became Pharaoh. He married the widow of Tutankhamun and Kesanamun. And he only lasted, I think it was about four years. And then he was, well, I say, and Scotty Chronicon says, he was kicked out of Egypt. Uh, again, people will say that I died in Egypt, but there is no evidence whatsoever that I and Ankesanaman died in Egypt. I think they went on this exodus, which is just what Scotty Chronicon records. And it wasn't a, they weren't just chased out of Egypt. Uh, this is a little like often happens. I think the same happened with Akhenaten as well. Um, they were advised to leave. Uh, and make their way elsewhere because they were gods. They were very difficult people to kill. It was very difficult to kill a pharaoh. And so they just you know, politely told them, go, organize an exile, and off you go. And they were given 60 ships. So it was quite a large fleet. So I, I, I guesstimate you could have about a thousand people on these ships, uh, load up with all of the um, stores you require, and off you go. And they sailed off into the sunset heading west, and they ended up um, in the Ebro Peninsula, which is uh, on the east coast of Spain. And I think they went there. I don't know if they had prior information about Ebro, but Ebro is the same as Egypt. It's a delta. Instead of being the Nile Delta, it's the Ebro Delta. So, you know, any farmers uh, with, with them on that party would have known exactly how to farm that land. It's exactly the same as the Nile Delta. Um, and they were there for a number of generations, but they were always constantly being attacked. So they went to the Balearic Islands, Majorca and Minorca. And we have evidence. I follow the evidence through because there are very similar sort of monuments in these different locations. And so we get upturned boat monuments in, in Menorca, uh, which are exactly the same as we get in Ireland as well. Uh, and so they were there for a number of generations and then they decided to go west again and they went round the coast and ended up on the Dingle Peninsula in Ireland. And then later they went to Scotland because at that time Ireland was called um, uh, Scotia that's where the name for Ireland came from. Uh, and that's why, you know, Scotland and Spain have the same name. You know, one is called Hibernia, the other is called uh, Hiberia. And so these exiles ended up in Ireland, uh, on the west coast of Ireland. And they went there because they knew it was pretty much uninhabited. So while they were always being constantly hassled uh, in Spain, they could have Ireland to themselves, basically. And they formed the basis of, of the Irish population. And that may be why we have um, a, a strong strand of ginger in Ireland and Scotland, because most of these pharaohs were ginger. So, and people don't seem to know that very much. It's not um, spoken about very often, but the mummy of... Um, the mummy of Yuya, who is the father or the patriarch, as it were, of the Amarna dynasty uh, of Akhenaten and Nefertiti, he is ginger, bright ginger. And you can see that on his mummy. And then Pharaoh uh, Ramesses II, Ramesses the Great. Now his, um, and this sort of proves um, what the coloring is. His mummy was taken to uh, Paris in 1986, I think it was, because his mummy was decaying. Uh, it had some bugs in it, 
And so they took it to the forensic labs in Paris uh, for preservation. And while it was there, um, Professor Kilcaldi did a full investigation of his mummy. And he determined that he was uh, a pale-skinned uh, man with wavy ginger hair. And that ginger hair has nothing to do with the mummification process because it's an entirely different chemical. Uh, and if you look at the mummy of Ramesses II, he was ginger. And so we have this strand of ginger now going with Scotty Chronicon, ending up in Ireland and Scotland. And this would have been, well, they escaped from, uh, from Egypt in about 1320 BC. So this is quite a long time ago. This is, you know, before the Iron Age, this is Bronze Age era. And they would have probably gone round to Ireland, maybe uh, 1000 BC or something of that nature. So again, quite a long time ago, before recorded history in, in Britain. And they populated the west coast of Ireland and, and, and uh, Britain. So it's an interesting story. And I find quite a lot of correspondence that sort of demonstrates that this um, uh, exile is, is probably true. In Ireland itself, there's a grave site, which is said to be the grave of Scota or Scotta. And so, and that's, I think that's in the Northern kind of area and people, you know, and apparently it's marked um, as a grave or it's mm. become like this kind of legend. I mean, uh, what do you know about that? And also the fact that in Ireland and in other parts of Britain, actually in, in Wales, in, in like the mold, uh, in the mold area of Flintshire, plus I think down in Cornwall, they found these faience beads, which are very specifically yes. an Egyptian design. Can you can you talk a little bit about her grave site and the fact that the, there's like with these beads, there's evidence of Egyptian connections? Yes, there are quite a few Egyptian connections. The the tomb of Scota is on the Dingle Peninsula, so that's on the west coast of Ireland. Uh, it's not marked very well. I had to search for it. I took a whole day searching for it with the help of the uh, chief librarian in Dingle. Um, and it's actually an outcrop of rock. So, and it's, it's, it's right by a stream. It's not where you'd want to put a grave. Um, so I don't think that is the tomb of Scota. But anyway, on the Dingle Peninsula, you do find a lot of interesting artifacts which are similar. Um, so we have the upturned boat tombs, um, tombs or churches, whatever they were used for, which are exactly the same as the ones on the Balearic Islands. And uh, we have these, they call them, what do they call them? They call them uh, fortresses. They have these big fortresses uh, up and down the west coast of Ireland, but especially on the Dingle Peninsula. And they're not actually fortresses. Uh, they're actually theatres. And that sort of changes the whole dynamics of the population that were there. You know, if you say it's a fortress, you've got this, um, this uh, petrified population, you know, protecting themselves against some unknown enemies, you know, hiding behind this big fortress. But if you say it's a theater, because it looks like a theater, it has terraces going up the side. I say it's a theater for many reasons. Well, now you have a population who's confident, open, having these big uh, theatrical displays. And one of the things that we have at the center of these theaters is round towers. And you have exactly the same round towers on Minorca and Mallorca, and you have them in Ireland as well, and you get them in Scotland. So we have a, this tradition of these funny old round towers, which I think are sort of like... Um, uh, phallic uh, symbols as, as some sort of like a, um, uh, what am I thinking? Not a stella, an obelisk, like, a, like having an obelisk. Um, like Mary Magdalene was the Mary of the tower, of course. And we have these fiance bees, as you say, which are typically they came from Egypt. So they're glass, basically. Um, and they're man-made. And that sort of man-made uh, artifact was not being made in Ireland, of course. They had to have come from elsewhere. And of course, one of the places they could have come from is on this exile from e Egypt. 
Now, if they'd gone along with 60 boats, they would have taken as much goods as they possibly could, things they could trade, things they needed. Um, and we know exactly what they took because we have the ship, the, um, I can never pr pronounce this name, is the Olaloon um, wreck, uh, which is um, on the southwest coast of uh, modern Turkey at Bodrum. And they found a wreck off the coast there which was loaded with everything you would need to start a new civilization. And they say it's a trading boat, but I'm not entirely sure it's a trading boat because it's not carrying one good. It's carrying everything you would need for a civilization. And of course, we know when this um, boat sank, well, we have a good idea because it carried a, um, a signet ring from Nefertiti. So it's the same era. And it could have been, this could have been exactly what these people were carrying on their boat, which was everything you needed for a civilization, including fish hooks and all of this sort of stuff, you know, everything you would require. Uh, glass ingots for making glass, uh, copper ingots for making copper, bronze, for everything you would require was on this ship. And of course, if they had gone round to Ireland, they would have had all of this goods they could have traded seance beads and gold necklaces and of course we have this real conundrum in ireland that the central thing if you go to the um dublin museum it's a great museum actually it is for a provincial museum it's really good and one of the central elements we have are these gold necklaces golden torques they're known as which could not have been made in Ireland. Ireland doesn't have that type of gold. It doesn't have enough gold. They didn't have the technology. There is no evidence of smelting gold in Ireland. It had to have been imported. And how could Ireland, which was, you know, typically sort of poverty stricken, import such expensive items? Well, of course, if they'd come on an exile with the uh, Queen Scota and King Gaethelos, then we know how those um, necklaces got there. And of course, within the Amarna era, the main element of trade within the Amarna era was golden necklaces. If you were a confidant of the king, if you were working well, etc., you were rewarded with a gold necklace. And that's exactly what we find in Ireland. Um, and so, yes, you, you mentioned mold. We have this um, uh, mold Golden Cape. Now, mold is on North Wales. It's just across the coast there from Ireland. And they found this Golden Cape, which again is from this Bronze Age era. And it's exactly the same as the Golden Capes they used to put on the, um, uh, not well, not so much the mummies, but on the um, uh, Shabbati, I think they're called, the, the small effigies of, of the uh, pharaohs, um, and the canopic jars. So when you mummified someone, their internal organs were put into canopic jars within the tomb, and they have little heads on them, like, you know, a king or a queen, and they were the, the ones from Amarna, uh, from the tomb of Tutankhamun, wear exactly the same cape as the mold cape. It's identical. I'm sure that's where it came from. So how did, you know, an Egyptian gold cape end up uh, in mold in Northern Wales? Um, it's not something that would have been traded, I don't think, you know, it's a vastly expensive item. But it could have come, of course, with an exile of some Egyptians to Ireland. It's incredible. I mean, it's. Just, I mean, this whole story fascinates me, and this. I, I think it's so important that these are these old stories, these legends, these old documents, and this is what you do. You need people need to look at these and not rely on the current version of history. And I think you know. I think you mentioned that in your new book, uh, was it Shards of Illumination, where you're kind of ac you know you're, you're kind of accessing these older documents, these old stories, these other things, and and the modern version of, of history is just all a bit wrong. Um, it's all just gone wrong. There's it's, yes. it's kind of written down in such a way that 
it doesn't go you know I, I know for instance in wales they changed the whole curriculum removing all the old stories um back in the early 1900s and pushing in this agenda to you know delete that and make it like a joke that all these these stories that have been r- around for thousands of years were not correct like troy and brutus and so forth so yeah i mean maybe you could um you know mention your new book um and how how this fits in with that yes they um They've given mythology a bad name, so it's become mythology. And I don't believe mythology is mythology. Too often, I've found a, a grain of truth in, in the middle of mythology. Um, so I think a lot of mythology is ancient history that's just been, it, it's had, um, you know, what do you call it? Chinese whispers and so on. Um, but at the core of it, I think a lot of it is uh, real history. And so it should be taught so we remember this, even if it's only taught as a separate subject. But just to always dismiss it, I think, is to dismiss a lot of our ancient past, um, especially with things like um, Arthurian legend. You know, I've got a book on King Arthur, which is very different. And the number of mythologies within Arthurian legend, which are most probably true, is amazing because it comes up with some crazy things that you wouldn't believe within Arthurian legend. It gives the history of Pompey the Great. What's that got to do with Arthurian legend? And it's a true history of of Pompey the Great. It gives the history of the floating islands of the Mediterranean. What are the floating islands? Well, the floating islands are what came off Santorini when Santorini blew up in 1600 BC. An Arthurian legend knows about it. Um, it gives the history of um, Hippocrates in Rome with Emperor Augustus. What's that got to do with uh, Arthurian legend? But I think it's true. Um, what it's actually saying with this, this story of Hippocrates uh, in Rome is probably true. So all these strange stories, which people would probably dismiss, uh, have a kernel of truth within them which is why I think things like Scotty Chronicon should be studied a little more seriously rather than just dismissing it, you know? Um, Well, okay. Give the Orthodox history, but just tell the tale on one side at least and say, well, you know, this is what they thought, um, you know, back in the 14th century or the sixth century, this is what they thought was the history of Scotland. Because I think there's more than a grain of truth in Scotty Chronicon. and regards my new book, <clears throat> it's quite a big one again. A lot of my books are rather big. So um, King Jesus is about 500 pages. Uh, Jesus, King of Edessa is about ooh, nearly 600. Um, the Grail Cipher, which is obviously the Arthurian one, is about 600 pages. And um, the latest one is Shards of Illumination, and that's again 600 pages. And <clears throat> what I thought I'd do with that one was go through all the questions I've been asked over the last five years. So it's going back over the last five years. I've been asked lots of questions. I've written lots of answers to all of these questions, obviously questioning me about my works and so on, what I've uh, declared. Uh, And given further explanation, because obviously if people are asking questions about that particular topic, then maybe I didn't explain it well enough in the first place in in the original book. So I go through it again and again. And, and try and explain it as best as I can. So it's quite an interesting book that jumps around from topic to topic all over the place. Um, so within Shards, I think I've got nearly 400 questions and 400 answers uh, on all sorts of topics. And I go into other things that people have been asking as well. So I do ancient history, theology, of course. Um, A little bit on COVID as well, because we've had some all sorts of strange things happening with with the recent pandemic. So I I answered some questions on that. Um, Academia, lots of questions on academia, all sorts of different questions. What else do I do? Anyway, there's a whole range of topics in that book. Um, So it's quite interesting. It's the sort of book you can dip into and dip out of, you know, on every page is different. 
Fantastic. Brilliant. All right. Well, well, Ralph, I think we're going to we'll, we'll, we'll tie this up today. We, we could go on. I know we could go on. Maybe, maybe we'll do this again and we'll get into some other subjects when JJ Ainsworth could join us, because I think she's been following your work for years as well. So um, maybe another time we can go a bit deeper. But we're delighted you could join us and we're delighted you can, you're going to be coming to Megalithomania 2022 on the 7th and 8th of May. That's fantastic. Yes. And also, of course, um, Ralph's going to be with us in ancient Egypt on 26th of October to the 7th of November. Um, and, and he's going to be giving lectures there. Discuss, we're going to be discussing ideas at sites. And uh, we also have myself and JJ will be there, as well as Yusef Awian, who's well as like an expert. He lives next to the Giza Plateau. Um, uh, I'm sure, I don't know if you've met Yusef before, but he he is just quite brilliant. He's a... Uh, absolutely amazing guy so um and i do recommend people check out ralph's website ed foo books i mean what what is the exact website please um it's edfu-books.com so edfu is e-d-f-u hyphen books and uh i'm not very active on there at present but i do an awful lot of posting on facebook so my facebook is uh, ralph ellis.144 um and you can pick me up there and there's quite a few discussions on that and also ralph does a, has got a series of articles on ancient-origins.net uh, and, and on the members area as well um and so yeah you can catch up with him there so and and there's the um youtube channel as well so i've got a youtube channel um it's not easy to find um if you dial in my name and something like um i don't know uh, Jesus, Arthur, and various other things, and then look for a thumbnail with a uh, a red and gold phoenix, and that will be my channel. We'll, we'll, um, put, the, we'll put the link in as well. In yeah, the, in okay, because it doesn't come up. If you search for it on Google, it, it often doesn't yeah. come up. We'll, we'll put all the links below anyway. So, and um, yeah, so yeah, thanks so much, Ralph. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Um, I'm, I'm, I've always been fascinated by the the um the research you did from thoth architect of the universe i'm, fa I'm personally fascinated by like the whole geometry mathematics and the sort of planetary kind of connections that that we seem to find so to uh yeah so it's been there's a, there's a lot to think about here and i want to you know thank everyone for tuning in thanks a lot megalithomaniacs we appreciate your support please check out ralph's work please join us both all of us at megalithomania in may and if you can come to Egypt with us later in the year. So once again, take care, megalithomaniacs. Thanks again, Ralph, and we'll see you soon.